Hello, good evening, um, good afternoon, happy middle of the night, depending on where and when you might be watching this. Um, wherever and whenever you are, thank you so much for being with us. My name is Aidan Flax Clark, and I'm coming to you from the New York Public Library, where I put together our public programs at Live from NYPL. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing this event, Reframing the Constitution. Um, it's inspired by two things, of the library's new exhibition, Treasures, and the new book, The People's Constitution, 200 Years, 27 Amendments, and the Promise of a More Perfect Union. It's a 233-year um, history of our Constitution, and thereby our democracy. And we're lucky to have the two authors of the book with us, uh, John Cowell and Wilfred Codrington. And they'll be speaking about the book with Caroline Fredrickson, a senior fellow at the Brennan Center, a distinguished visitor at Georgetown Law, and from 2009 to 2019, the president of the American Constitution Society. Um, speaking of the Brennan Center, Wilfred and John also come to us from Brennan. Uh, Wilfred is a fellow at the Brennan Center and John is Brennan's vice president of programs. And we are very proud to have produced this event in partnership with the Brennan Center and frankly to have benefited from an amazing partnership with them on a lot of events over this past year. Uh, we're really lucky to have that association and we'd like to thank them for that. Um, specifically, we'd like to thank Lisa Benenson, Bianca gomez Nashand, and Adrian Yi. Um, if you aren't familiar with Brennan's critical work defending democracy, reforming justice, and protecting the Constitution, go to brennancenter.org. As for the People's Constitution, if you don't own it already, I promise that after tonight's event, you will want to. It's really a tremendous book. I just so loved reading it. Um, and we'll help you get your copy um, with links in the chat to purchase it from the library shop. Um, and you can also find that link on the event listing, as well as in the reminder email that we sent you about this event. Um, you also can borrow it, of course, from us, the library, um, as well as some of the additional reading that John and Wilfred have recommended. Um, all you need is a valid New York Public Library card, which obviously everyone who's watching this who lives in the New York area already has, but just in case, we've put a link so you can get a library card also on the event listing, and you'll find it in the chat as well. And uh, on the event listing, you'll also find links about how to borrow all those books. So like I mentioned, tonight's event is also inspired by our new exhibit, Treasures. Um, the Polanski exhibition of the New York Public Library's Treasures showcases some of the most extraordinary items from the 56 million in our collections. Uh, they tell the story of people, places, and moments spanning 4,000 years. It's sort of a greatest hits from our special collections and kind of a greatest hits from history. You have art, photography, geography, philosophy, poetry, and of course, politics, which is why we're all here. Um, behind me is a library's copy of the draft of the Bill of Rights, uh, which you're going to learn more about in just a minute from Charles Carter, who is the assistant curator of the library's Carl H. Fortzheimer collection of Shelley and his circle. You can go see the Bill of Rights as well as everything else behind me, plus much, much more for free. All you need to do is go to nypl.org slash treasures to register for your free time ticket. Um, and if you can't make it in for any reason, you can explore that page for a digital version of the exhibition, an audio guide, and much more. Um, we'll put that link for the, in the chat for you as well. Okay, I'm going to hand things over to Charlie in just a second. Um, just a couple quick things. If you would like to ask John or Wilfred any questions, they would love to answer them. They'll get to as many as they can at the end of the conversation, but get them ready now, and you can send them at any time by putting them in the chat, um, on the Google form, on the event page, as well as by emailing publicprograms at nypl.org. Um, we'll make sure that they see them. Lastly, real-time captions are available for tonight's program. You can, of course, click on the closed caption button, um, or you can use the stream text link that we will share in the chat right now, and it was also shared for you in the reminder email. Um, okay, so thank you again for being here, and let's turn things over to Charlie Carter. My thanks to Aiden. I'm really glad to be here tonight, broadcasting from the New York Public Library on 42nd Street and 5th Avenue in Manhattan. Mr. Cowell and Mr. Codrington's book presents constitutional history in a way that provides context, both for understanding our country's current constitutional situation and for thinking about possibilities for our constitutional future. I'm gonna ground my introduction here in the constitutional past, specifically in archival material documents that record and represent certain constitutional moments discussed in the book. Primarily, the one represented here 
by this manuscript. This is one of the big stars of the Polanski exhibition of the New York Public Library's treasures. It's our original official copy of the document, a manuscript on parchment that in 1789, for the first time, presented proposed amendments, 12 of them, to the United States Constitution. When a couple years later, 10 of these amendments were approved by a majority of the states, they became the Bill of Rights. When this manuscript was created, the seat of the federal government was of course, New York City at the old federal hall, about an hour's walk downtown from where the library now stands. So wherever the manuscript might've traveled after it was created, and that's a subject for debate upon which I'll elaborate in a little bit, we can think of it as having come home in a way. And here at the library, it's available for absolutely anyone to visit and see for free, along with about 250 other truly remarkable library holdings in the Treasures Exhibition. And here it is on display. I think some people are, are surprised uh, by just how big it is when they first see it in person. And as you can see here, it's nearly a yard tall. Why is, why is it so big? Well, it's parchment, not parchment paper, but parchment made from the skin of a sheep or a goat or a calf, which animal precisely we don't know. We'd have to have a molecular biology test done to determine that. But in its full form, parchment is roughly animal sized and tends to stay that way, used for large formats. By the 1780s, paper had long surpassed parchment as the standard item for writing on, but the durability, the association with important or ceremonial or legal matters made parchment the natural choice as the material basis for the Bill of Rights and America's other founding documents. Uh, speaking of America's other founding documents, some of you may be thinking, hey, I've seen the Bill of Rights and it was in Washington DC, not New York City, uh, alongside the Constitution and the Declaration. What did? Well, the Bill of Rights is the only founding document of which multiple copies, multiple original copies were made to be sent out to the state governments for approval. The copy on display in the rotunda in the National Archives Museum is what's called the enrolled copy. We can think of it as the federal government's file copy. But 13 other official copies were made, one for each of the states or soon to be states in 1789. The New York Public Library's copy is one of those 13. So here's the National Archives file copy on the left compared with the New York Public Library's copy on the right. It doesn't take long to see differences between them. There's of course the slight difference in color but the, look at the actual writing. There's a big difference there too. Let's zoom in on the headings and compare. The National Archives copy on top takes up much more space. And look closely at the shapes of the letters in the words Congress of the United States. The G in Congress has a loop tail in, in the National Archives copy and a much simpler curved descender in the NYPL copy. There are other differences, but the comparison of these two manuscripts becomes more interesting when we start to look at other copies out there and see that there appear to be two distinct variants among the original copies of the Bill of Rights. Along the top, you can see the enrolled copy at the National Archives, the New Jersey copy, and the North Carolina copy. These all have the larger heading. On the bottom row, we have three copies with the smaller heading, the Delaware copy, the Virginia copy, and in comparatively sorry shape, the South Carolina copy. I believe there's more work to be done determining the significance of these manuscript variants, but rather than getting too far into the paleographical weeds, I'll pivot here to point out that beyond the moment of creation, each of these copies of the Bill of Rights has its own story. North Carolina's copy was stolen from Raleigh by a Union soldier during the Civil War. It disappeared for decades before turning up in the 21st century. It was seized by the FBI and returned to Carolina personally by then FBI director, Robert Mueller. In 1990, at a time when public spaces were finally becoming smoke free, Philip Morris borrowed Virginia's copy of the Bill of Rights and paraded it through a high tech $60 million 50 state exhibition in effect to promote the idea that one of our inalienable rights is the right to smoke. 
There are four copies of the Bill of Rights that are officially unaccounted for. The ones whose original destinations were Georgia, New York, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. The New York Public Library copy must be one of these copies. In most sources, Georgia's copy is quickly assumed to have burned during the Civil War. I think more research needs to be done on this. One reason, diary accounts of the arrival of the Yankees in Milledgeville, then Georgia's state capital, describe a ransacking of the state library, not a burning. Union soldiers were seen carrying off books and presum presumably other library materials by the armloads. As for the New York copy, destruction by fire was likely its fate. The fire at the state capitol in Albany in 1911 destroyed nearly 800,000 historical items and documents. Maryland's copy seems to have simply disappeared or possibly never made it to the state archives. A similar story with Pennsylvania. As late as 1990, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania was still looking for their copy. But as the state archivist then said, they simply had no record of it ever being held by the archives. So which of these unaccounted for copies is the New York Public Library copy? We can't say for sure, but here's what we know. In 1911, the New York Public Library opened its flagship building on 42nd Street, where I am right now. The New York Public Library copy of the Bill of Rights was here from day one and has had a home here ever since. But it belonged to the New York Public Library even before this moment. In 1896, one of the first trustees of the library bought the enormous collection of Americana put together by this man, Thomas Addis Emmett. Emmett was one of the leading gynecological surgeons of the last quarter of the 19th century. In his long and meandering memoir, he describes patients bringing him manuscripts from all over the place. He also describes his boyhood trip to Philadelphia that inspired his lifelong enthusiasm for American history. That Emmett was known for shopping in Philadelphia is part of the reason that some people believe the New York Public Library copy was originally Pennsylvania's copy. And as a, as a result of this belief in 2013, the library agreed to share display rights of the manuscript with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So whenever it's not on display here in New York, you'll probably be able to see it in Philly. As a part of the Emmett collection, the Bill of Rights is in good company. Over 10,000 manuscripts from America's early years are in the collection, including other, uh, another headlining star from the Treasures Exhibition. One of, the only, one of only six known copies of the Declaration of Independence in the hand of Thomas Jefferson. Thanks to a lead gift from the Polonsky Foundation, the entirety of the Emmett collection has been digitized and is freely available online through the New York Public Library's digital collections. And the last point I wanna make is that the Bill of Rights is merely one star in a constellation of remarkable historical resources at the library, items that provide insight into the context and impact of constitutional moments throughout American history. It's difficult to imagine living in the moment when it wasn't yet clear if the Constitution would even be ratified. But here from our James Madison papers, we have a letter from Madison to his little brother about a month after the Constitutional Convention drew to a close and the founders were waiting to see how things would pan out. Madison says, it is not possible to say now on which side the majority will finally lie. Other items point to moments of constitutional failure and gesture toward the Constitution's original sin of implicitly condoning, indeed incentivizing, slavery, and the centuries of fallout radiating from that. The library Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture has two copies of this rare pamphlet by the educator and writer John Wesley Cromwell. The Challenge of the Disfranchised, a plea for the enforcement of the 15th Amendment, was published by the American Negro Academy in 1924 at a time when serious work was being done in some states to undermine the voting rights of black Americans. They say history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And today, of course, there are states passing incredibly restrictive voting laws. Researchers can use New York Public Library research materials like Cromwell's pamphlet, like the James Madison papers and the manuscripts of the Declaration and the Bill of Rights to think about the best ways to address 
conceive, and try to help shape our constitutional futures. And with that, I'll pass things over to Caroline Fredrickson, Wilfred Codrington, and John Cowell to talk about the people's constitution, 200 years, 27 amendments, and the promise of a more perfect union. Wow, well, thank you. What, what an introduction. I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and come into the archives and start using those documents. That's for anybody who works um, in the world of constitutional law and scholarship, um, that is just a rich, a rich set of materials and very exciting to be able to see it um, it displayed that way. Um, hopefully we'll all be able to get there in person one of these days, but um, it's really a wonderful um, beginning to uh, the conversation we're gonna have today. Um, so I'd like to first just say good evening, everybody, or good afternoon, again, wherever you are. Um, thanks so much for joining us for this program. My name is Caroline Fredrickson. I'm a distinguished visitor from practice at Georgetown Law uh, and a senior fellow at the Brennan Center. Um, I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with the Brennan Center's John Cowell and Wilfred Codrington about their book, The People's Constitution, 200 Years, 27 Amendments, and the Promise of a More Perfect Union. So, um, you know, most of you, I think, are familiar somewhat with this history. Um, 1787, the 55 original framers gathered in Philadelphia to write the Constitution. But the Constitution as we know it today is largely made up of amendments added after 1787, work that took an imperfect document and made it more democratic and more responsive to our country's changing needs. The addition of the Bill of Rights saved the Constitution from near defeat. And you saw what, what James Madison wrote to his, to his brother. The Bill of Rights was part of the the plan and how to get the Constitution over the finish line. The post-Civil War battle over the 14th Amendment gave former slaves citizenship, and the 15th Amendment gave Black men the right to vote and banned racial discrimination in voting. But the, and the defeat and recent resurgence of an Equal Rights Amendment, now a century in the making, may yet enshrine the rights of women. Over the last two centuries, when Americans found themselves polarized along partisan or regional divides that blocked normal channels of legal change, reformers were pushed to consider extraordinary means to achieve their aims. Which brings us to our conversation tonight with the authors of a really great book, The People's Constitution. So a brief background on our wonderful authors who are not only brilliant, but also really nice. Um, Wilfred Codrington is an assistant professor of law at Brooklyn Law School and a fellow at the Brennan Center. His work focuses on constitutional law, election law, race, and anti-discrimination. Wilfred, Wilfred's scholarship and writing have appeared in the uh, New York University uh, Law Review, Columbia Law Review, um, as well as the Atlantic, Slate, US News and World Report, and other places. John Cowell is the Brennan Center's Vice President of Programs, and his expertise includes constitutional reform and judicial independence. John authored an essay entitled The Improbable Victory of Marriage Equality, which was published in the Brennan Center volume, Legal Change, Lessons from America's Social Movements. So we have this backdrop. We, we saw that incredible manuscript of the Bill of Rights. It's so interesting to see the other ones in the South Carolina. What did you do to your Bill of Rights? <laughs> um, maybe a metaphor for other things um, based on what's going on with voting rights right now. But, um, but really interesting you know, to see, especially as we talk about you know, the text, um, to see the text. So I'm gonna start with a variety of questions. We'll have you know, a, 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 a time to discuss uh, a lot of issues, but we're gonna have uh, opportunity to hear from all of you out there in the audience um, when questions will be open to you. But first I just, I wanna ask you to, um, and feel free either one of you to start, um, but you know, it's been, okay, we don't have a lot of amendments to our constitution and it's been a long time since the last one. So um, what's the point? Why did you decide that this was now the time to write a book about 
the amendment process? And what do you think are the chances at the moment we are at right now, being in such a polarized country, that there could actually be another amendment adopted? Okay, well, I'll, I'll start out. Thank you, Caroline, for moderating this discussion. And thanks to the New York Public Library, which I can honestly say is my favorite civic institution in the city. Um, thank you for hosting this event. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe, but John and I began writing this book more than four years ago. And we like to think we saw clearly what was occurring in our political and legal system. And we agreed that it did not bold well for Americans. And now here we are today in the wake of the January 6th insurrection, these battles over the Supreme Court, these assaults on American democracy that are underway in the states and in Washington. Uh, and we believe our goals for writing the book should resonate even more. And that is because Americans need this history. And so if we sow the seeds of amendment, of amending the constitution, maybe we the people can benefit immensely by reaping some important structural change and obtaining reforms that revitalize our democracy, uh, protect our fundamental rights and make the country more governable. And so I, our work is kind of revealing and we reveal this, that there's a historical pattern. We amend the constitution in these clusters and waves. And that's to say that usually we're in this state where we're not amending the constitution, um, but we are also, when we amend, we don't amend in a staccato manner. So we're amending in this way that there are thematically consistent reforms, they're connected, and that's because our problems during these times were connected. And so we are in this period now, living in the shadow of the last wave of amendment and recent change, trying to figure out what we should be doing in light of our current circumstances. And that's kind of the big thesis of the book. And you know, John helps to lead an organization that is helping to grapple with uh, today's polarization, or at least has to work through it. So I'm gonna let him address that part of your question. Yeah, so, so thank you again. It's, it's such a great honor to uh, be doing this event at the New York Public Library. Uh, you know, we wrote this book because we were uh, you know, well aware of the prevailing wisdom <clears throat> that it's just too hard or maybe even too dangerous to amend the constitution. <laughs> And we, we see that as a failure of imagination. <clears throat> I mean, the story of fixing an imperfect constitution and making it better can't be over. Um, and when you pull back and look at the history, and we can talk about it over the next uh, 45 minutes, you see a pattern, which is that we have, as Wilfred said, we've amended the constitution in bursts, followed by long dry spells. And you know, I think of a story in the book that in 1905, the Washington Post wrote a an op-ed that was tut-tutting about efforts by women suffragists and other reformers to pass amendments to the constitution to give women the right to vote and to give the American people the right to choose their senators, which is not something the framers gave us. And the op-ed in 1905 says, it's just not possible anymore. And as soon as these activists learn it, the better off they'll be. Not four years later, there was a tectonic plate shift, and within 10 years, four important amendments were, were uh, added to the Constitution to modernize governance and to expand our democracy. The addition of women was the largest democratizing event in American history. So you know, we, we're writing this book because we see this pattern that what seems impossible can become possible. And paradoxically, long periods of polarization like we're living through today often set the table for action once there is a swing of the political pendulum, which I believe is imaginable in the next you know, couple of decades. Well, I mean, that's really inspiring. And I, you know, having read your book and really loved it, I, the progressive era and those of that period was really you know, impressed me with um, that very thought that, you know, think about the Gilded Age and the kind of that the, the grip that the, the plutocrats and you know what we call oligarchs now, right? The, the trusts, um, the, the Rockefellers and the, all the super wealthy um, had on American politics. The fact that you know, so many state legislatures were basically sewn up. Um, uh, there were people had very little opportunity to actually have any impact on what was going on. And yet they didn't give in 
they didn't give up and they went on and, and, and passed, as you said, this, this wave of, of amendments that were all very um, linked in terms of kind of distributing power more broadly. Um, that was really very inspiring. Um, you know, were there other moments or um, aspects of doing the research that you found either um, really surprising, unusual, unexpected, something you hadn't really known before, inspiring? I mean, sort of what jumped out at you while you were doing your, your work that you'd really like to convey to people as like something that, you know, kind of beyond what you had originally expected, especially you two are both pretty familiar with the history and the Constitution before you got into this business. Yeah, so you know, I was struck by the the the, the power of perseverance and the per, the power of just what one person can have. I mean, if you look at you know, there are many stories in the book of how one person propelled an amendment forward when nobody cared, when no when, when there was apathy, when there was you know, imp, you know, the political circumstances you know didn't allow it. You know, so I mean, some of the great champions we've been talking about the Bill of Rights, but. Uh, you know, and we urge you to read the book, but it's a remarkable story that, you know, today we rightly venerate the Bill of Rights and view it, you know, that it's, it's, it's there right next to the Constitution in the National Archives. But, you know, uh, at the time of the framing, even though Caroline's right that it was uh, strategically a wise move to bring the country together and answer some fears that Americans had about a more powerful national government, the, in fact, there was very, James Madison had very little help. Uh, his, the, 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 the proponents of the constitution didn't think any changes were needed. They wanted to see how the constitution would work. The enemies of the constitution, and there were many, and they almost blocked the constitution. They really didn't like the stronger national government, but they used the, bill, the, the lack of a bill of rights as the wedge issue that was really powerful. But once Madison said, fine, I will, you know, pursue a Bill of Rights wouldn't lift a finger to help him. So he had to do it all by himself. And it's really a remarkable story that he deserves incredible credit for. You know, one other story I'll mention is Alice Paul. You know, uh, Caroline says that we're mm -hmm. 100 years from the initial uh, release of, of the Equal Rights Amendment. And Alice Paul, who was a, a suffragist who came in and helped push the 19th Amendment over the finish line to give women the right to vote, uh, spent really the next you know, 50 years of her life just pushing and pushing and pushing the amendment. And it finally came, you know, it's her perseverance was rewarded, but it's not for the faint hearted. <laughs> Say that you know, enemies of amendments also like Phyllis Schlafly, uh, one woman did a pretty good job of derailing the Equal Rights Amendment. I would say, you know, it's interesting you bring up Alice Paul because, you know, she, she was, she stuck around for a long time and we talk about perseverance. I mean, she actually ended, helped get, um, sex added into Title VII, which is the employment discrimination law, the part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, because yes. she must have been, you know, 85 or 90, but she was still lobbying. She was still walking the halls of Congress trying to get the ERA passed. And so she helped get that done. Um, so um, now I'm going to ask both of you, this is sort of, you know, I think we, we people tend to think that prohibition was the, the dumb one, right? That was the one that didn't work out. The amendment that, you know, they, they repealed it pretty quickly afterwards. It was pretty, you know, actually remarkably fast considering how the amendment process generally works. Um, if you had to pick one that you think was bad or wrongheaded, is that the one? Or are there other, is there, was there another amendment that you think um, maybe, you know, was maybe could have been put in the circular file instead of, you know, added to the constitution? Uh, I, th I think John and I pretty much agree that that's the one, right? <laughs> the, the, the idea of actually putting in this policy in the constitution to ban something that was actually something that could be banned under the current structure was just doesn't make sense, right? And so I, I guess that speaks to the inappropriateness of that that policy specifically, not just that it was a bad policy, right? But changing our constitution was designed to be a significant undertaking. And we can talk about whether it's too difficult, mm -hmm. but it was designed in a way so that it should be a big deal and we should be thoughtful and not alter it to accomplish these regular policy goals like prohibition to do things that we can do already under the constitutional design. Um, and so there are other 
things that we might think of as problematic. Today, I want to talk about an attempt that's ongoing. It was, um, so there has been this push for a balanced budget amendment. And this has been something that's been ongoing since the 1970s. And it has proceeded in fits and starts. Um, but the idea is to impose a balanced budget to make sure that our um, the money we spend is never going to be more than the money we take in as a federal government. Whether or not you agree with this, and I don't, but uh, whether or not you agree with it, we can do that now. And if we are unwise enough to do that, then we can do it under the current system. Um, now, the balanced budget amendment effort also raises some other questions. It's being pushed through this never tried uh, attempt to get a constitutional amendment through Article 5. That raises some fundamental questions. Um, but in any event, um, there are attempts to do things that we can currently do under our system and things that are um, just sort of small ball politics that should not be enshrined in our country to tie our hands forever. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just, I, John, I want to ask you about this because, I, and Wilfred, it's great to bring up Article 5, because I think people, you know, we tend to all know generally that the Constitution was amended through the process of Congress passing the amendment and going out to the states and the states ratifying it. But I think it's because it's never happened that there's actually been a, a constitutional convention, um, apart, apart from that first one um, that we could talk about with when they kind of basically... Uh, they didn't follow the rules. And when they came together, the, the framers were supposed to just fix the Articles of Confederation. And instead, they, uh, they deep sixed the, the articles and, uh, you know, moved to adopt a totally new constitution, which was completely outside of the parameters of the instructions of what they were given to do. And they even adopted it in a way that was not within the rules of what they were told they were supposed to be doing. Um, but John, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of the, like how these amendments actually get adopted? Yeah, so you know, you, as, as you know, Caroline says, America had, had a, a, a first constitution called the Articles of Confederation. It, to, to make any changes required the consent of every state, which proved impossible. And it was one of the reasons that they decided to throw it out and start over with a new constitution behind closed doors. Now, the, you know, that the, so the problem of, of like, how do you have a, a flexible enough constitution was top of mind. But the constitution was a document written in a committee of 55 people. And you know, they had other issues to think about. And so you know, as our book explains, they didn't really spend as much time as you would think thinking about the method of, of uh, how to, the amending process. And so what they ended up doing was slapping together the different ideas into one uh, a provision of the constitution. So article five of the constitution sets out the rules for amending the constitution. Is we call it the amending two-step because there are two stages. Each stage, confusingly, has two different ways of achieving that stage. So at the first stage is proposing an amendment. The only way we have ever done it is that Congress, by two-thirds vote of each house, uh, agrees on the language of the amendment and proposes it to the states. The, sec the, the second method that has never been used uh, and frankly was added at the very last minute to appease George Mason, who then turned around and refused mm -hmm. to sign the Constitution anyway. Uh, the second method uh, bypasses Congress. And so essentially, two thirds of the states, instead of two thirds of Congress, can petition for a convention that, that Congress must summon at that point. And that convention would propose amendments. Uh, the process then follows to ratification, where three quarters of the states ratify uh, to the amendment to be in the Constitution. Either the state legislatures do it or special conventions can be called in the states, which was done once. So um, that's the process. The, the, the concern that Wilfred is referring to is that we've never had this kind of an Article V convention. James Madison was very worried about it, saying, well, what would be the rules? How would it work? What's the format? And he also knew what he did, which is that he, went, he organized a convention to fix the Articles of Confederation. And they did something entirely different. We can be grateful to them, but the question is what would happen if two thirds of the states convene this convention? The, the, uh, you know, and what people talk about is the fear of what is called a runaway convention. That once it's formed, they can make wholesale changes to the constitution. It's why throughout our history, 
we've gotten close and then people get scared and they pull back and we never have quite had one, but the risk is very much alive today. There are two efforts to do that right now. Mm -hmm. um, well, so um, let me ask you this question. So we've talked about the one you thought was the worst, that was prohibition. Um, and um, what do you, I'm not gonna ask you what was the best, but I'm gonna ask you what, 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 is, what did they leave out or what, what should we have in there that you, you know, kind of thought through as, is it the ERA, is it, is it the right to vote? Is it something that you, something else entirely, the right to a clean environment, um, um, all of the above? Give me an idea of what kind of in your top 10 list or your top three list maybe. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, Karen, let me ask you a question. How much time do you have? <laughs> yeah, <well. laughs> it, it is really imperative that we update the constitution by adding or revising several provisions. And so you, you asked what was another problematic one or what we'd add. I mean, this is in the constitution and we could sort of change it by uh, better the constitution by changing it. And that would be uh, getting rid of the electoral college, just eliminating the electoral college. It is that anachronism that resurfaces every four years. And it is among the chief concerns that drove us to write this book in the first place. That is when Donald Trump became president despite losing the popular vote by nearly 3 million people. And in my job as a law professor, I think about this and I write about this in a lot of my scholarship. And so what I think, and I think John's with me on this, um, the presidency is a difficult job. And it has only become more difficult. The presidency has become more significant and more influential than the framers ever thought. And given as much, the presidency needs the legitimacy that comes with a popular mandate. And those popular mandates come through direct elections. So we have this president, the sole person to represent all Americans should be held to account by all Americans, and that's being elected by the greatest number of Americans. And, you know, you can just think about it. In what other system do we give the prize to the person who comes in second? We just don't do that because it's not fair in a political system. It disrespects the voices of the people. And so if the Electoral College were a car, it would be a lemon. We should get rid of it. <laughs> Uh, trade it in, maybe, maybe sell it and give the money to NPR or the, yeah, the, the, the public library. The New York Public Library. Or yeah. the New York yeah. Public <laughs> Library. Um, and, and, you know, um, turn to a direct election so we can choose people who we have comfort in and are suited for the job. And let me just throw in this last thing. The last election we had, the defects in the Electoral College had facilitated or at least gave the time and opportunity for that violent mob and the nefarious plot that Trump and his advisors had been um, plotting and that we're learning about every day. So I would say get rid of the Electoral College and let's start by electing the, the president by popular vote. Yeah. And to put a finer point on it, the electoral the Constitution doesn't even require that people vote for president. It says basically state legislatures choose the method. Now they all have chosen because the American people demanded it, that it be done by popular vote. But the idea that, you know, that, you know prominent legal scholars and politicians and TV talking heads are saying that a state can just, you know, a state legislature can choose a different state of electors and send them to Washington and throw away the votes of the people is only possible because of the ridiculous archaic system we have today. But to answer your question, Caroline, mm -hmm. I say the failure to ratify the ERA is such a glaring omission to the Constitution, and I would love to see that rectified. But I also think the lack of a, an express right to vote in the Constitution has been a source of great uh, mischief and worse in, in our 230 years in America. The framers couldn't decide on, on creating a, like a, a they, they, did, they didn't really want the everyone to vote. They really thought only property owners should vote. In the end, they let states decide who votes. And we've had a steady increase and expansion of democracy, but with huge problems, the exclusion of women, Jim Crow, uh, you know, but today we see that in all of these laws, and Charles referred to that in the beginning, but these laws to severely restrict and, and create impediments to the people's right to vote, that only exists because the Constitution gives states a power to do that. And, 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 and you know, while 49 state constitutions have a right to vote, the federal constitution nowhere says explicitly that you have a right to vote. And I think that adding that would strengthen the voter's hand against these sorts of laws.
Well, so let me let me ask you both because you know uh, it may be on people's minds. Uh, the the people who come to New York Public Library events um, may very much pay attention to what goes on in the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, and uh, as a backdrop to this conversation, you know, thinking about you know your your wonderful discussion of the recon Reconstruction amendments um, that followed the Civil War. Um, wow the end of slavery and the uh, uh, insure, assurance of, of citizenship to, um, to all citizens, people born in this country, birthright citizenship um, and, um, and the right to vote for black men. Um, but it really took a long time. Um, it's still an ongoing project, right? For those things to actually, those amendments to be respected. Um, you know, all we've talked about already in terms of the, the laws that are being passed across the country to restrict voting rights show that um, that there's always, you know, a constant rolling back that you have to, it's like Sisyphus trying to roll the boulder uphill. Um, but so get, tell us a little about, you know, what does the court have to do with all of this? Yeah, so uh, the court is an essential part of this process in one regard, or in multiple regards, but I will say that the court has no official role in amending the Constitution. But eventually, when there's battles over what the Constitution means, it's going to be decided by the court one way or the other. And so what we need to do is to ensure that we have a court that is going to enforce the Constitution. Now, you mentioned the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, essentially, uh, so the 14th Amendment is chock full of goodies. It, it, it guarantees equal protection and due process. It has done other things like make the Bill of Rights applicable to the states as well as the federal governments and so many other things. Um, the 14th Amendment was effectively dead letter for nearly a century after it was passed. And that was because we had a revanchist Supreme Court that refused to enforce its mandates. And so we went through this period of Jim Crow. And we went through a, a longer period where women did not have equal status. And we think about these other rights of equality for LGBT folks, for other minorities. Um, those did not exist because the Supreme Court did not read the 14th Amendment's requirement for equality and due process to apply to those people. So the Supreme Court is very important. And so one of the ideas we, we sort of discuss, even though we don't make any sort of advocate, I would advocate for it, is some reform to the Supreme Court to ensure that it has the legitimacy and the accountability in a way that we can ensure that our laws are going to be enforced in a way um, so, so they apply equally to everyone and they protect our fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, I, I just... I have to say, I, you know, people go back and reread the, the 14th Amendment. And you see that language about privileges and immunities and you say, what's that? Do I have that? It's like, nope. well, no, nope. the Supreme Court decided that part wasn't worth enforcing a long time ago. Um, sorry, John, I cut you off. I was going to say that the, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the court did, you know, did, did not enforce the 14th Amendment to uh, in the interest of its intended beneficiaries, the African-Americans who been liberated from slavery, but they did use it to protect corporations for years. And the reality is the Supreme Court has been a reactionary force for most of our history. M many of us who grew up in the shadow of the Warren Court and the thinking of judges as liberal, you know, they, that has not really been the experience of Americans for most generations. And, that, and there's, you know, anger over the rulings of a conservative to reactionary court have inspired you know, many constitutional amendment campaigns in history. You know, the story of the income tax amendment was uh, basically overturning what was a case that was viewed as the Citizens United of the late 19th century, you know, the Pollock decision that where the Supreme Court struck down Congress's power to uh, impose an income tax. Through much of our history, the courts have not you know, vigorously applied the rights in the constitution. And they also have sometimes not vigorously applied the framers' vision of a national government that was strong enough to address our problems together. And you, you see that creeping back in today. Well, thanks. I mean, I think it's just such fascinating history that sort of this interplay between the document, the original constitution, the Bill of Rights and the role of the courts. And to the extent that we see, you know, the amendments having 
different understandings over different time. Um, you know, if you, you talked about the Citizens United and thinking about the First Amendment, um, which in, I think, Madison's original version was actually the Third Amendment. Um, uh, and now all of a sudden, just like the way that the 14th Amendment was interpreted by the court at the, during the, at the end of the 19th century to protect corporations, um, now we have the First Amendment, which was supposed to, I think, defend political rights for all of us to enshrine democracy in the Constitution is now protecting the rights of, of plutocrats to buy uh, politicians and win elections uh, through the use of money. Um, so it is just that it, it sort of I, I mean, I, I know neither of you come out of a kind of an originalist, um, strict constructionist um, background, but. Does the story of the of the uh, Constitution and the Bill of Rights here and how it's changed over time does that how does that affect your kind of thinking about how to understand the the actual language in the document? Well, I think one of the real reasons you know, we we undertook this project, in addition to just challenging the prevailing wisdom that it's not worth trying to amend the Constitution just because it's hard, uh, the other is really you know, we really wanted to engage in the public at a and when people are hearing more about originalism. And originalism can mean different things to different people. And that there are some progressive originalists that I think are doing amazing work, but very often originalism means, you know, stuff that happened before 1800, you know, and it means, the, you know, giving into the worldview and the public understanding of a time long gone. But we point out in the book that more than 40% of the constitution was written after 1787. And it was written by different generations and infused the Constitution with, uh, with a democratic legitimacy and made the Constitution a far different document. So if you're going to talk about originalism, let's talk about the original intent of the 14th Amendment and bring the, the, you know, the Reconstruction era you know, idea that this would be a sort of national protection and not just uh, you know, something to protect constitutions. I mean, so I think I, I do think progressives make a mistake if they don't tap into the of text, history, and meaning of the Constitution. What our book shows is the long history of the Constitution is largely a progressive story. Mm -hmm. and, you know, let me just add that, you know, we advocate for these textual amendments to the Constitution, these formal amendments to the Constitution. But as, as I noted up front, the general status quo is that we're not amending the Constitution. And we have these ways we sort of informally amend the Constitution. And one of those ways is the way that the Supreme Court interprets the Constitution to account for things that are happening today. I mean, if we have a case before the Supreme Court that involves the internet, you know, as far as I know, James Madison did not have Tic Tac or Facebook or any of these other things that might present questions and present difficulties for our democracy. So going back to this idea of originalism and saying I'm looking through the books and the history and trying to understand what James Madison would have thought about these contemporary problems is really farcical. And, and that's kind of the project that's going on now. And it kind of has taken over the conversation about the constitution. So really, as John said, we're trying to engage the American people and sort of make them aware of the things that are going on so we can actually do something about it. Well, I, you know, I think that's just absolutely a brilliant way of, of encapsulating your book. But, uh, you know, I think that, you know, the other thing that comes clear when you read the book is that, um, you know, the fact is, is that the, the, the document is amended. The amendments actually work backwards, right? In the sense that the, 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 that they're changing the document to reflect the understanding that, that pertains. And so everything that came before has to be read in light of the, the amendments that came later, right? So that our understandings about liberty and due process and equality, et cetera, have to be understood, not what at how they were understood at the time, but how they've been understood as it's changed, even in the document and the text of the, the amendments that came later changed the understanding of those very terms. So um, it, it is an evolving understanding in that sense. Um, so I, we're getting some really great questions from the audience and I, I would uh, I encourage other people to send in your questions if you have them, but um, um, one really great question, I think that um, since, we're, since we're here, um, virtually in the New York Public Library, um, which is an incredible um, institution for scholars, but also for education. Um, how do you think um, 
we should change the way we teach the constitution and ratification um, because of what you've learned. Um, what are the things that you might you might ad address differently to to students after um, uh, uh, after go undergoing the the research process that you went through? Well, uh, I, that's a great question, and I look. I think we. I think. Uh, I think back to my own education. I think we focus a little too much on the four months that the fifty five men you know worked and toiled in the, a closed. Uh, room in Independence Hall, and we should focus a little more on what happened over the next couple of years, because that the, the complete story of the Constitution isn't what they signed in, in September 1787. The, the framers understood that to have legitimacy, the Constitution would have to be ratified by the people, and they did something extraordinary. They, they bypassed the politicians in the state legislatures, and they required that every state have an election and that ordinary people can run for this election and be part of a convention to determine whether to ratify the constitution. And you, you know, in our work, you, you go and you read through the minutes of all of these and you know, there were just so many ordinary citizens saying, I like this part, I don't like this part, I want this. In the, in the course of these ratification uh, debates, ordinary people, and there were some elite people, but there really was a remarkable assembly of people. They crowdsourced 92 different ideas for amendments. And you know, at the end, Madison took 12, but there were lots of other ideas. And but so I say that as inspiring because it really meant from the very beginning, the, the people had an important role in making in ordaining and establishing the constitution. And the people, you know, had ideas that were different than what was handed to them by the men at the convention. And I think that's you know, they, I, I think that it's evidence that they intended that this would continue, this ferment and change and mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me um, ask you in, 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 in light of that, um, what, um, we have some, some questions that ask about, um, you know, for example, um, the Senate um, and how that came about. Um, are, there, are, are there thoughts that about, you know, how you might change that or anything that you, you know, I mean, the filibuster itself is not in the constitution. Is there something that could be um, done to make the Senate itself more representative? Yeah, so um, the Senate is an interesting issue. Um, so the Senate came about because, you know, you had some states that under the Articles of Confederation, the states all had an equal say in the Confederation Congress. So that meant that a very small state could veto uh, projects, necessary improvements, and often it did. That very small state was Rhode Island, and we take jabs at Rhode Island quite a bit in the book because it's so true. Um, but the compromise, which they called the Con Connecticut Compromise, was that you would have these two uh, chambers of Congress, the House and the Senate as we know it. Okay, so the Senate um, right now represents each state and the idea is, and it's, and it's enshrined in the constitution, in fact, in article five, is that no state can be deprived of its equal, equal representation in the Senate without its own consent. Um, so that becomes really problematic because when you say, you know, are you gonna deprive yourself of your equal representation? What state would actually say yes? Um, that seems like a, a really um, big obstacle, um, even bigger than amending the constitution. Um, what this provision actually means, I mean, scholars debate that. They debate whether something can actually truly be unamendable, but you know, so that de debate's going on. But there are other ways we can think about this. One is you mentioned the filibuster. Well, the filibuster, as you said, does not exist in the constitution. And so this is just a procedural rule that has existed. And, and Caroline, you know, as a former legislative mm -hmm. staffer, that that rule has been used to thwart some of our most important bills, including the Civil Rights Act, right? These, these measures that were able to be thwarted for quite some time by Southern segregationists, the change in the Electoral College that could have abolished the Electoral College in the 1960s and 70s. It was thwarted by the filibuster. So we can start by reforming or get rid of that. We can also add more states. We have territories and land and, and, and areas of the United States, like the District of Columbia, like Puerto Rico, that we just do not treat um, equally. 
right? The, and these happen to be uh, places where there are people of color predominantly, and, and they just don't get a say in voting for senators or voting members of Congress. And so I would say that we have other ways to actually uh, make our Senate more inclusive um, before sort of, you know, trying to get rid of the entire Constitution or trying to figure out what Article 5 means in terms of equal state suffrage. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, that is so interesting. And I think one of the things that is often, you know, surprising to people is that you can admit, admitting new states, that does not actually require an amendment. That's just an act of Congress. Congress has that power. It's in the Constitution. Um, John, I want to take you back to, you talked about kind of the ordinary people crowdsourcing amendments um, at, the, um, at the original Constitutional Convention. Um, uh, Madison, you know, working, you know, with a lot of, a lot of people came up with lots of different ideas. Um, some, one of the uh, members of the audience asked about some of the subsequent amendments. Um, are, are, were there, were there kind of ordinary people who drove those too? Was that, you know, are there particular stories that you found kind of really compelling when you were doing your research? Um, well, the, you know, most, I mean, to be fair, most amendments have been written by, politicians, you know, the, the Bill of Rights was written by the first Congress. Uh, but, you know, uh, I'm struck again by the story of not only the 19th Amendment, the Women's Suffrage Amendment, and the Equal Rights Amendment. So the, the, the Women's Suffrage Amendment uh, was written by Susan B. Anthony, and um, I'm, I'm forgetting my, her colleague's name, I apologize. So it, it's, it, they're the only words in the Constitution written by women. And so, and they they wrote it because you know, there, were, there were no politicians you know, in the 1860s after the Civil War, when there was talk of uh, you know, enfranchising black men, they, uh, you know, they said, well, what about us? We've actually been working in the abolitionist cause. You know, we're disenfranchised. Some of it was actually somewhat tinged with racism and ugly saying, you know, why are you letting black men vote instead of we refined ladies? But, but, but they, they, they weren't getting any help from members of Congress. So they, they wrote the amendment themselves. And, and Alice Paul as well, you know, the Equal Rights Amendment was also written by a woman and a, a citizen, a private citizen. Most amendments, however, have been written, um, I would say by politicians, although they um, were, have done it many times at the behest of social movements, whether it was the abolitionists, whether it was the temperance moving look, movement and alcohol, whether it was the populist and progressives who wanted to take corruption out of our government. You know, this, I mean, there were numerous amendments to the constitution that wouldn't exist if it weren't for, you know, people power of social movements demanding that this change be made. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I think that's so inspiring for all of us because, and sometimes, you know, it seems like they have been written by politicians or people who were maybe experts in the area, but the people who got it done for the people out in, in the country who actually were the movers and the shakers and were, were marching and, you know, hunger strikes and yes. doing all sorts of, of, of other really important things. Um, so um, we are getting down to the end of our, of our time, but I wanted to, since we, we talked a little bit about the electoral college and this has come up with a couple of the questions. Um, so there are some interesting ways that have been proposed to change the electoral college or to, to provide a direct uh, election of our president. And um, you don't need to get into necessarily into a constitutional analysis of the compact clause or, or anything, but can you talk a little bit about, you know, the national popular vote and sort of what the theory is behind that as sort of a, a kind of a workaround if, uh, if we don't actually amend the constitution? Sure, yeah. So. Um... John mentioned that, you know, the original constitution doesn't even require that we vote for the presidential electors. This power actually belongs with the state legislators until they give it to the people of their states. And so the idea of the national popular vote is for those state lawmakers to say that, hey, no matter who wins the popular vote in our state, we're gonna give our electors to whoever wins the popular vote nationwide. And so the idea is once you get enough states, states that have uh, 270 electoral votes worth of electors, um, signing on to this agreement to do that 
then they will have enough to elect the president by the popular vote. So it is, in a sense, this workaround by using the electoral college system that we have to kind of make it, um, to obviate it. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're, it's actually moving along, but it's stalled a bit, but it's pretty close. You know, there are 196 states worth of electors that have signed up for that. So that's about 75 or so percent of the way. Um, and now it looks like it depends on what other states are going to do. Are you going to get some coalitions in some red states? Are you going to get more purple states to do it? Most of the blue states have signed on. And so now I think advocates who are pushing for the national popular vote are looking for a way forward to get it, get the job done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, so we are now at eight o'clock and I know in theory we were supposed to end, but I can't let you go quite that quickly. Um, so I want to ask you one last question, um, and um, and this is this is uh, you know kind of a hard one because um, it sort of goes right to the question about how the Constitution is amended. Now you've described in you know incredibly inspiring terms um, the, the successful good amendments, um, some um, unfortunate good amendments that haven't yet been ratified, some bad amendments that happily happily weren't ratified either. Um, but is, do you think that the, the very difficulty of Article 5 is, is, a, is a good thing? I mean, does it require like a, a, a real coalescing of a social movement um, as opposed to if it were an easier process and it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily bring this broad um, group of people from across the country together? Um, so what do you think? Should we make it easier to amend the Constitution or do you think it's good the way it is? I, I you know, I believe there are pros and cons to it. As I said earlier, the framers doesn't appear from the record that they thought it all through, but it, it does seem based on what they said during the ratification debate in the Federalist Papers, uh, they, they talk about the desire to kind of find a middle ground between a constitution that is too rigid and a constitution that is too mutable. The truth is that there were a lot of hard compromises in there to, you know, to preserve, you know, the compromises between uh, you know, proponents of slavery and those who abhorred it, compromises between people who wanted more democracy or less democracy, compromises between big and small states. And they didn't want those compromises undone too easily. Uh, so uh, um, that's why we have the system we have. Um, I have changed my mind over the course of writing this book because I've always thought that there's something good about it not being too easy to amend the constitution. And you know, when we've seen, you know, for example, state constitutions can be very easy to uh, amend. And so you've seen campaigns to take away rights from immigrants or gay people. I mean, there's an ugly side to just being able to easily change a constitution. If you're gonna protect rights and protect democracy and protect property, it can't be too easy, but maybe lowering the threshold of ratification by the states would be uh, something to two thirds. I mean, I, there's, there's, um, you know, there, there are people who suggest different versions of that. I, I think that there could be value in making it a little easier to get across the finish line, particularly given the regional uh, uh, differences in this country. Yeah, and Carolyn, I'll just add that, you know, the problem is we could have a very small minority block, um, block any feasible constitutional amendment, less than 15% of the country in a bunch of states. And so that's really problematic. So I think we also need to uh, think about new ways for uh, amending and, and ratifying in a way that would be less onerous. But let me just say this, inertia is a problem. Things that are in rest remain in rest unless <laughs> they're acted upon. Cynicism is also a problem. Cynicism breeds more cynicism, unless there's something to displace it. And we do have Article 5 as a structural impediment. But these have always been problems. And if we're going to amend the amending provision or add any of these ideas that John and I spoke about and the ones that you raised or the ones that everybody out there are thinking about themselves, we need to actually face them. And the secret is these have always been problems and they've been particularly heightened in the periods right before we amend the constitution. And so what did the American people do? They fought inertia with energy. They fought cynicism with activism and they did the difficult job of strategizing and collaborating and engaging to surmount these obstacles that they faced and they amended our constitution and they made the country fairer, 
more just and more inclusive in the process. And so we need to do that. Well, well, that couldn't be a better way to wrap up this discussion. I'm all inspired to go out to the barricades now um, and, and do what it takes to get the Constitution in better shape. Um, I think we can love it by loving it uh, into a better place. Um, so John, Wilfred, thank you so much for this great conversation today. Um, uh, your book is just fabulous, The People's Constitution. 200 years, 27 amendments, and the promise of a more perfect union. And thanks so much to this great audience. There's a whole lot of you who tuned in tonight and sent us some really terrific questions. And thanks so much to the New York Public Library for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. For more information and to register for upcoming programs, visit nypl.org slash live.